Welcome, everybody. Um, back to our sixth session now um, of the International Scientific Conference 2022. Um, this session uh, is with um, with uh, Marit, uh, who needs no introduction, but I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Philip Sandner. Um, welcome, Professor Sandner. Um, he is the head of the Frankfurt School of Blockchain Center at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. Um, his uh, expertise includes blockchain technology and, and, and crypto assets, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, he's interested also in the digital programmable Euro, which is uh, of, of interest to a lot of us, uh, and tokenization of assets and rights and digital identity. Um, uh, his organization, uh, the Frankfurt School of Blockchain Center, advises financial organizations, industrial corporations, and startups concerning their blockchain activities. So obviously there's a you know, a, a significant influence on, on the way things are developing in, in, in Europe. Um, and Dr. Philip is also a member of the FinTech Council uh, of the German Federal Ministry of Finance. Um, so he's been engaged with the EU Blockchain Observatory uh, of the European Union. Um, and he co-founded the German Blockchain Association, uh, the International Token Standardization Association, and the Multi-Chain Asset Management Association. So a very, uh, very busy man. Uh, welcome, Professor. How are you? Yeah, thanks much for being here. Uh, happy uh, to be here. And today is an exciting day, right? We have this politics going on in the European uh, Parliament about the Bitcoin ban, you know, which is ho horrible. But thanks for organizing this and thanks for being here. Yes. Great. Pleasure. Um, well, yeah, if, if you'd like to like to commence, that would be, that would be magical. I should start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, we can start. Thank you. Okay, yes, perfect. Yeah, so uh, actually, you know, uh, right now uh, here in Frankfurt, we are having our masterclass uh, blockchain with uh, 60 uh, students. Um, but I wanted to do this uh, speech. Uh, so therefore, the students are sitting in the room. And I said that I might come a couple of minutes later. And until I'm back, please read the Bitcoin white paper, because everybody in blockchain must have read it once. Uh, so that's the perfect time for the students to basically must uh, read it. Uh, and I will uh, check back when in half an hour I'm back in the room. I will check whether they have done it. I will then... Half an hour, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So what uh, exactly? I have I have made some notes. You know, I, I think it's, it's very interesting what's currently going on uh, with regard to international politics, of course, Bitcoin, the digital euro, and so on. And maybe I would like to first uh, give a couple of minutes on the digital euro because as we know um the uh, the token as such is basically some kind of vehicle uh, where you can package everything into you let the token run on a blockchain format and then you for example can package the euro the pound the us dollar and so on into it therefore i think the stablecoin discussion is currently very interesting in europe as over here in germany the discussion is basically called uh, digital euro I think with you guys, it's called digital pound. In the US, it's called digital dollar and so on and so forth. And I think it's very interesting to basically highlight what's what's going on here in this in this field of the digital, I, I, I now say euro, but you, you, you know what I mean, pound, uh, whatever, it's everything the same. So I think it's interesting to basically observe uh, what's basically doing, uh, what's, what's happening here, because China is having their solution already on the market. China has launched uh, their digital yuan solution a pro probably around uh, the Olympic Winter Games now a couple of weeks ago, and China began developing this back in 2014. Yeah, so China has uh, spent a couple of years investigating this, developing this, now they are live. And China has done uh, extensive test runs about their solution with 140 million people, test runs with 140 million people. Entire Germany has uh, 82 million uh, people. So the test runs in China is basically twice as large as uh, the German population. You know, this is massive. So China has a solution for their digital uh, currency. And uh, to some degree, it could also be imaginable that China is expanding the infrastructure, for example, to Africa or to other countries as well, uh, with, with which they are doing import-export uh, business, primarily import, actually, right? It's, uh, so therefore, also for a German-based company, for example, Siemens in Munich, I could imagine in half a year or in one year that uh, China is, says, is telling Siemens that Siemens please on board uh, to this new platform because Siemens is uh, supplying uh, smart city solutions in China. Therefore, Siemens wants to get paid. And China could say that, 
yes, Siemens, you are getting paid, of course, you did your service, but the money you're getting with our Chinese uh, currency platform. Yeah, That's not written anywhere, but I could imagine that would, this would say, make sense just by adding up uh, what's currently happening. And therefore, I think this is something to focus on. That's China. If we now turn towards the US, then we see in the US that the Federal Reserve is not having a similar project, but since last week, the White House made its announcement for the regulation on crypto assets. We also now know that the, that the steps towards the US-based uh, digital dollar solution will be increasing in terms of speed and dynamics to try to catch up with China. I think catching up with China here is not possible because uh, China is already live and uh, in the EU, but also in the US, all this development is currently getting started. But interestingly, and I, this is something that I would like to lead your attention to, there is already some kind of digital dollar, but it's called stablecoin, right? Stable coins are nothing else than some kind of digital dollar. We have a market cap of US dollar on blockchain systems around 80 billion, um, which is small in comparison to uh, the money supply, right? But still it's growing. Maybe next year we are at 150 billion. The year, are at, the year after is uh, 300 million. So there is a digital dollar already existing. It's called stable coin but it's not regulated properly yet. So once you are um, like making the, the regulation on stable coins from the US side a little bit stronger, then you could also call it you, uh, digital dollar, right? So, so uh, this brings me to my key point of this little um, mentioning. China is having a solution for the digital yuan. The US dollar is starting to find out that they have a solution for the digital dollar. It's called stablecoin, right? It's working already. Money is transferred here, trans transferred here. And the European Union here is not having a, solution, an, in, in a similar solution. There is neither a solution by the European Central Bank, which is currently drafting some reports about how to potentially define uh, the, the digital euro. So there is uh, nothing being developed right now. And there is also no significant digital euro stablecoin, right? So we neither have the public solution like in China, but we also nor have the, the private commercial uh, solution as is the case in the US. We have neither solution. And I think from a European perspective, now talking for the EU and the ECB, this uh, really might bring the European currency area into some uh, trouble uh, future just because this topic is not addressed uh, properly. That was the first half of what I wanted uh, to tell you. And um, then um, I would like to turn uh, to uh, crypto assets and basically two, three points here. I think it's very interesting to see what happening, what's happening these days, because we see uh, the, the, the Ukraine and the Russia um, conflict or war um, unfolding. We see that uh, there is increasing pressure on crypto exchanges to also execute the sanctions, uh, right? Apparently Coinbase, Binance and all the other uh, com uh, companies are confirming that they are also um, applying these sanctions towards uh, sanctioned uh, people and so forth. So we see here that there is some kind of regulation dynamics now um, existing. Um, but we also have to admit that the, that because of regulation of the last years, the, regu the regulative pressure on crypto exchanges is now existing such that uh, they have to follow the sanctions and they have to also um, they also have to block uh, sanctioned uh, people, right? So I think the current statements on Twitter by Binance and by Coinbase that Coinbase and all these companies are also following the sanctions is basically one subsequent effect of the regulation which took place in the last couple of years, which said, we are the government, we are doing regulation, please uh, crypto exchanges, you can operate your business, but please follow the rules. And part of these rules are also um, complying with sanctions lists, right? I think that's a very interesting point. On the other side, uh, you see that the government is basically trying to create powerful central elements in the crypto world uh, to basically still be able to control what's going on in the crypto market, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, that's uh, very often peer-to-peer, -peer. it's decentral, it's anonymous uh, or pseudonymous and so on and so forth. But in case you are introducing central elements, they are like crypto exchanges, Coinbase, Binance, then you can still indirectly um, control what's going on here. That's the 
uh, sanction uh, topic, which is good how, how it has been unfolded this way, because uh, Binance and Coinbase are following the sanctions um, against uh, a couple of Russian people, right? I think this is basically a good development. On the, other, on the other hand side, the crypto ecosystem has to strongly monitor that the government is basically not uh, exceeding uh, and over exaggerating their regulation to not interfere uh, with the with the freedom these technologies might um, uh, bring to us. And therefore, last comment, therefore, I think it's very interesting uh, to read through the White House statement from last week. Last week, uh, Biden and the White House has basically emphasized that they now plan to regulate the entire market around crypto assets. They um, partly, there is a little bit of substance missing in this missing. Yeah? So uh, the White House did not really express how they want to exactly do it. They for now assigned responsibilities. They say the, uh, the, the Ministry for Treasury is responsible for this and the Fed is responsible for this. So they assigned responsibilities, but they didn't really explain how they would like to do it. But two points I think are really standing out from the White House announcement. First of all, in the first paragraph of the White House announcement, it is being said that 40 million US citizens have invested in crypto assets. Yeah, 40 million, that's 16% of the adult pop population in the USA. And I think, you know, surveys have, have actually said the same, but it's, it's really bold to have the White House stating in this announcement, in the first paragraph, exactly these numbers, not playing this down, accepting this, and then subsequently assigning responsibilities for the regulation to come, right? I think this is a very bold uh, statement and should also provide us with some optimism that, for example, um, a, a, an outright ban of Bitcoin, something like this, is not something on the agenda on the, on the US. This would not have been possible now uh, after it's coming very clear that the White House uh, acknowledges 16% of the US population of adults have invested or are trading uh, with cryptocurrencies yeah that's interesting and the last point is also interesting that they that the us now wants to step up their efforts for developing uh, a cbdc a central bank digital currency uh, to basically drive the dollar into the future in form of some kind of digital uh, dollar yeah that were my the two statements i wanted uh, to make um, i hope uh, this is fine and if you have questions, you know, please let's let's discuss. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that, Doctor Um <clears throat> Marit, um, do you have any any thoughts on on this? The team. Marit, you are on mute. Uh, yes, Professor Sandra, we had uh, an interesting chat in the morning by uh, one of uh, the MP. Uh, from the British Parliament. Uh, his opinion was slightly different that uh, the technology is not giving them the answers they would like to have from regulatory standpoint. So if the market is not regulated, how could it be unregulated? Was that, that was a question. Yes, if market is not regulated, applying sanctions or not applying sanctions wouldn't change much in terms of regulatory process. Yeah, that's, this is absolutely right. So um, I think, um, as a, my, you know, this topic is changing every day. So whatever I'm saying now, you know, might, might honestly be wrong tomorrow or next week, right? But uh, indeed, the technology is not something you can regulate. You, uh, in case you would like to regulate Bitcoin, then you would also have the possibility to, to shut it down. That's not possible, right? So the way to regulate what's going on in the market is to regulate the companies in the market, which are providing gateways from us as human beings into the blockchain. That's the crypto exchanges. And indirectly via them, monitor um, on what's going on and also basically passing through the sanction lists to them such that they please stop doing business with with those people on the sanction list right from my side this makes sense and the large scale crypto exchanges binance kraken uh, and uh, coinbase is also doing exactly this so therefore it's interesting to see the regulation has exactly the desired effect that now uh, the the companies have to operate within the boundaries of the regulation especially 
the large ones and especially the large ones where also uh, people in, in Russia could exchange very large sum of money, you know, like billions. Um, but you are still right. What's happening with smaller scale exchanges, localized exchanges, not multinational companies in multiple jurisdictions, but maybe smaller ones, focused ones in specific countries, maybe also uh, smaller ones which would like to grow and are happy if people are exchanging their money uh, with, such that uh, these exchanges might not follow um, the, the sanctions and the sanction list, right? I think this is something which, uh, of course, needs to be observed, but on a, on a cross overview perspective, I would say that, uh, that right now you cannot use cryptocurrencies to evade the sanctions and the sanction lists because regulation is, stop, is basically blocking you from exchanging US dollar in, uh, in Bitcoin. Once you would have had Bitcoin and exchanging it back to Euro, Pound or whatever, then you can't do this because sanctions are again blocking you. And if you are looking at the large scale exchanges where the large volumes are, they cannot do this. And in case you are inspecting the, the trading of ruble, uh, Russian ruble in Bitcoin and, and so on, then you see that the numbers there are not skyrocketing, right? So apparently uh, you see that basically this is working. So the route towards exchanging large amounts of money is basically blocked. That's not saying that the route for transferring money into the crypto ecosystem is blocked forever. I think this needs to be very strongly watched. And I think it's fine that the regulators are doing this. But right now it's not possible. You can still exchange smaller amounts of money. You know, this is what you can also see with, with the statistics on Binance and so on, that people are indeed exchanging Russian rubles towards Bitcoin. But the numbers show that, uh, that this is basically I think 16 million US, as in, in terms of US dollar per day, which is being exchanged, 16 million per day. Uh, it sounds a lot, but that's not the billions of Russian oligarchs, right? That's, that's my take on this. Yes, like just one, one more, one question. Um, when we talk about uh, inclusivity, decentralization, globalization, but on the other hand, we see um, um, legislations being discussed on, on proof of work ban, which I believe is a feature of Bitcoin and not a bug. And then <clears throat> UK banning uh, a Bitcoin ATM machines. While on the other hand, there are countries like small countries, El Salvador, embracing Bitcoin as a legal tender. How do you see this shift um, and, and how would this affect um, in terms of uh, the, the theoretical possibilities of more inclusion and globalization, but at the same time, we are making it slightly difficult for technologies such as Bitcoin to, to flourish and to reach uh, the masses and for more uh, global communities to participate in terms of mining and, and buying and selling, etc. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I also thought about this a lot on the weekend. But to be, uh, to be honest, you know, Bitcoin doesn't really care. You know, Bitcoin doesn't care whether the European Union uh, or the European Parliament tries to ban proof of work. You know, Bitcoin really doesn't care. You have El Salvador uh, now um, uh, operating with two national currencies, the US dollar and Bitcoin. Potentially, there might others be coming. Uh, maybe also uh, uh, central banks are diversifying their reserve into Bitcoin at some point of time. Why? because it's a scarce asset uh, which is keeping their uh, the, uh, its value and uh, other currencies are uh, inflating uh, year by year, right? So so Bitcoin doesn't really care about the European Parliament, so to say. Um, it's a network, you know, it's it's just technology. How, how can it care, right? And uh, therefore, to answer your question, I think the, uh, the, there might be some kind of a signal effect coming from this towards other countries. But at the end of the day, I don't think that it has a major effect for the world. It, I also I also cared about the Bitcoin price on the weekend very closely when when this uh, when from Saturday morning this entire discussion unfolded and what did the Bitcoin price do about this potential uh, threat from Europe? Nothing, right? Nothing. The Bitcoin price started Saturday morning with thirty eight thousand US dollar and now it's still at thirty eight thousand. There is basically no fluctuation. Nobody cares about. Uh, uh, this potential uh, threat coming from European politics. I think this is also um, 
people haven't discovered this, you know, the, the, the information over the weekend uh, this, uh, f this has been very quickly distributed across the globe, but just, but nobody cares, <laughs> to be honest, right? Uh, so therefore, uh, the, the, the impact on the countries you mentioned, right, financial inclusion and so on, I think is, uh, is, not, is not significant. Countries might adopt it or not, uh, regardless of what the European Parliament thinks. But I think the, there is, so, there, so the primary risk here is that we in Europe and primarily we in the European Union are basically kicking out uh, the, the driving force of an entire um, technological uh, phase of an entire te technological path and therefore we are driving talent out of the European Union, we are driving businesses out of the European Union and we are trying and, and, and with the signal coming from this we might also uh, kind of hamper or block people from investing into this because then there are rumors there that uh, politicians don't really want it, there's a ban and of course this distracts uh, people a little, little bit. So at the end of the day I think in case this is going through, you know, we will know today in, in two, three, four hours, we will know how this unfolds. Um, but to be honest, I think at the end of the day, the EU uh, would make an incredibly short-sighted uh, decision for banning uh, proof of work here. And uh, it might impact the, the way the industry or the financial market is digitally transformed or not. And also speaking for Germany, you know, we have good machinery companies and sensor companies and chemical stuff, you know, that's amazing. But we have missed out on the Web2 platforms, you know, we don't have uh, Facebook, Apple and so on in, in Germany. That's really close to nothing, but we can do some e-commerce, that's fine. And now with blockchain technology, uh, we could participate in the next transformation from Web2 to Web3. And with potential decisions like this, um, we would not participate in this transformation. Thank you. Thank but you. for the EU, no, you, have, you, have, you have exited the EU, so please make it better. <laughs> okay. Can I ask one last question before, before you get back to your, uh, to your yeah. student? Um, you, were, you were talking about the, the digital remember, you know, C, uh, it was something in relation to CBDCs, uh, and we were talking about the digital remember right at the beginning. Um, and you said that um, you know you didn't think that that um, you know, the euro or the, or, or the dollar or the, or the or sterling would be able to catch up. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think, why you think that, and the reason I ask is that Chinese digital systems are either closed systems within China as a general as a general thing, or they're being forced to be closed in China because um, you know Western businesses don't operate in China, uh, either refuse to operate or, 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 or find it so difficult that they, that they go in and then come out again. So what, what are we catching up against? I say we, but what, what, what are the other digital um, currencies catching up against to the sort of central bank level? Um, I, you know, as I said, you know, I think that the, uh, there will be so there will be a solution for the US dollar. And I could imagine that the stable coins are morphing into some kind of a widely accepted digital dollar solution, you know, like a uh, check here because um, uh, especially these tokenized US dollar versions as stable coins, you can transfer them from wallet to wallet, uh, wallet across the entire globe. Um, and China basically starts in China with its solution, but could also expand it to trading partners with which it's doing trade, you know, like African countries, European countries, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, actually, I, do, I don't know the situation uh, for the digital pound, to be honest, but uh, in, in, um, for, the, for the euro, we see that the European Central Bank is, is basically investigating this topic and there is some speed, but the speed is, in my mind, uh, too slow. And at the same time, uh, we also see no possibilities to have a significant euro stable coin, right? Why is this? First of all, we have the Mika regulation, which is basically good. Honestly, you know, it's a good regulation. But there is, there are the, one of the main criticism which is still left is the excessive regulation for stable coins, such that any issuer of stable coins immediately heads over to the US because it's easier to do leaving out Europe. You saw this with Libra and DM leaving Europe, uh, also in this case Switzerland, um, moving back to the US, right? So you see this here very nicely. And then the second point is we have negative interest rates by the ECB, such that an issuer of euro stable coins has to operate at a loss. Now, how, how are stable coins uh, working? You are distributing the tokens in the market. They are not interest bearing. Interest rate is zero. 
but still you have to keep euro on the bank account and you have to pay negative interest rates because that's how the, the interest rates have be, uh, developed. So once you are issuing a euro stablecoin token and once you're getting successful and once you grow, the larger you grow, the more loss you produce. Yeah, so tell me any company who want to, you know, freely, voluntarily operate at a loss. Does make sense. And therefore, if I would be thinking about issuing a stable coin, there are two reasons uh, why it's easier to do this in the US and not in Europe, right? And that's, and you also see this now, the market share of US dollar in the stable coin segment is 99%. That's the result of it. Great. No, that, 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 that's my question. Thank you very much. Um, so, Dr. Psan, <clears throat> um, Maurice, Nassim, uh, thank you very much for another excellent session. It's been uh, really enjoyable. Uh, everyone else agrees. Um, we, I'll, I think I'll close the session now. That's uh, no, 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 Brian, 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 no, 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 no. We are not closing. It's, 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 it's my, it's my presentation. I'm, I'm too fast off the, uh, too, too, too fast the trigger finger. <laughs> uh, so sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, I've got about <clears throat> 20 minutes uh, or so to, 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 to conclude my presentation. So what I thought I would do is uh, just give you a brief overview of uh, the UK's blockchain roadmap, which has been discussed um, uh, multiple times since this morning, and um, what it's all about, uh, how did we devise it, and what are the implications uh, for this. So you may have you may have read this. Uh, this is uh, UK's uh, National Blockchain Roadmap Excellent Standards Framework that was uh, published uh, about six seven months ago. And what I thought would be useful for the audience is to walk you through the roadmap, the key recommendations, and why it was produced, how it was produced, and what are the implications for the UK economy, and how other countries can also. Um, uh, benefit from some of the uh, recommendations from this whole. So devising uh, this framework was a considerable uh, challenge. It took us almost uh, 18 months to put this document together. And what you see at the front end is maybe 35 odd pages. But um, behind the scenes, we reviewed over 5,000 research papers uh, and evidence synthesis of more than 2,000 case studies uh, on blockchain and uh, research papers, uh, collecting evidence, involving stakeholders, interviews, data analysis, consensus building, uh, workshops, and so on. So it is available on the, on the BB website in case you wonder where it resides. So why do we need a national roadmap? Why does a country need a national level blockchain strategy? So there, there can be a number of reasons. A roadmap can serve a number of uh, purposes. The reasons might be one or more or all of these. So uh, it could serve as a signpost for future development. It uh, could guide policymakers uh, in better decision making, uh, engagement with private sector. It can act as a blueprint uh, to devise further strategies and policies and create benchmarks and, and an informative tool to construct the key components of a DLT-based economy. So it is essentially a six-step uh, procedure. We start with context. Uh, what are the key goals? How do you achieve those milestones? Um, what are the main barriers to adoption? Uh, then the action items, and then your priorities and timelines. So it is time-bound. It's time-bound, uh, time-specific. But it could be open as well, because things are moving and changing very, very fast. So. Even though you plan, uh, make a 10 year plan or a five year plan, it can take uh, longer, it can take shorter, but at least you have something in writing. So the context is important. Then you uh, uh, collect all the information, you analyze the data, and then you design and then implement the roadmap. Uh, so you have your, your core steering group, uh, the main body responsible for spearheading all the efforts. So in the UK, we have uh, the British Blockchain Association. Then you have a, a, a consensus, uh, a, a, co a collaboration of uh, further stakeholders whom you consult. And then obviously there is there is general public and the, uh, the, the end users. Um, <clears throat> this is just a slide to, to, to show you how the process uh, actually works. 
in terms of uh, uh, starting with the uh, uh, the areas where you need to to work on and and how do you go through this so the first step is is preparation and background work and i suppose the the, the most important question is what are uh, the barriers to adoption and what has been done so far so we looked at uh, thousands of research papers and case studies um, from the UK and also uh, from uh, uh, from other countries on what uh, what has been done. Obviously, there there, there is there's not much uh, in terms of national level roadmaps. Uh, there are a handful of countries that have published uh, a national level blockchain roadmap. So um, we the best we could found uh, was uh, case studies, policy documents. Uh, consensus reports, etc., and also uh, individual research papers. The next is what are the key barriers to adoption? So you can't just produce a document which serves no purpose. You have to look at what has been done and what has not been done and why it has not been done. So what are the key barriers to adoption? Um, and the barriers to adoption could be many. Uh, you, we, we, we discussed this morning about regulatory challenges, education and awareness, uh, senior level buy-in from policymakers, uh, and, and a combination of things. So a lack of coherent, coordinated efforts. Um, then you have to look at who is positively leading the discussion on blockchain. So in, in the UK, we are very lucky to have a senior level buy-in. And we, we heard from uh, Martin uh, Hughes MP and, and John Glenn and Lord Holmes is, uh, is talking later uh, in the day. Uh, we have uh, we are very lucky to have a very very uh, uh, engaging uh, leadership, senior level leadership, uh, who are uh, uh, positively contributing. So they they are they are they are not cynical uh, about uh, blockchain, but they are they are looking at how it can positively contribute. So I think it's very very important in wherever you are, which part of whichever part of the world is, who is leading the discussion and how receptive your government is to the idea of DLT for public good. So that's the first step. So UK has um, published many high level reports, uh, starting with Sir Mark Walport's report in 2016, uh, distributed ledger technologies beyond blockchain. Then you had this um, Lord Holmes report on distributed ledger technologies for public good in 2017. And then um, another paper which was published in the JBBA uh, written by three members of parliament uh, Eddie Hughes, Lou Graham, and Lee Rowley. Uh, very, very important paper. I recommend all of you to read. Unlocking blockchain, embracing new technologies to drive efficiency and empower the citizen. And so this is a research that was published in the JBBA looking at some of the barriers to blockchain adoption. Uh, barriers could include uh, how people perceive blockchain technology, how businesses perceive blockchain technology. Do they see it as being risky? Uh, what can we do to address this? Uh, this is so. This is more to do with education, raising awareness, etc. Um, this is all in public domain. This is an open access research infographic that was uh, published by the journal. Um, so the lead contributors to the UK's national blockchain roadmap. Uh, uh, I was the lead author uh, with other uh, researchers and advisors from the BBA. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Martin Hughes, uh, who's the chair of all party parliamentary group, member of parliament, and Lord Holmes, who is the vice chair of all party parliamentary group on blockchain. Next step is collecting the evidence. So these are the use cases. So has what is the demonstrable benefit of blockchain to the society? Um, are there any evidence and thesis, any national guidelines in other allied disciplines. So maybe you do not have a, a, a policy document or a roadmap on blockchain, but you may have something similar in other allied disciplines, such as um, uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, robotics, AI, VR, AR, uh, whatever it is. So maybe you could use that as a starting point or take some inspiration uh, to construct your framework. And of course, you can uh, you can uh, use the the BBA's uh, blockchain uh, framework as well. This is uh, this is open access. We don't have any IP or or, or anything uh, to that. So uh, feel free to to take the ideas from this and and build a framework, a roadmap for your own country. So you look at the use cases and what are the use cases. It will be good to look at 
the use cases, particularly in your own region, in your own geography. Uh, if you do not have any, you can uh, always look uh, beyond your region and see which, which uh, uh, case studies have made a positive impact. So, so some of the use cases that we uh, included in the UK's blockchain roadmap are, uh, so these are UK-based uh, case studies. This is the one looking at blockchain for public services. This study was published by the Companies House UK, which is the largest organization, uh, organization responsible for uh, keeping a record of all public registered uh, companies, limited companies in the UK. And they looked at uh, how blockchain could be utilized for um, infrastructure uh, management, data management uh, across uh, various different organizations. Uh, from from DVLA to companies house to law enforcement agencies and universities and others. So blockchain for citizens, government and public services, important study. Uh, you also look at when, uh, if you are planning to implement the blockchain as an infrastructure, what are the risks? What are the cybersecurity risks? How do you deal with it? Um, this is another plain language summary. These are the infographics of research papers that uh, we uh, we produce at the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain, and the whole the whole idea is that it makes it easier for non-technical readers and policymakers to benefit from the research. These are uh, some more researches on distributed ledger technologies for smart cities. The the research on your left was published by the BT. British Telecommunication presented at our conference in IC 2020. And the one on your right is from Professor Kevin Curran, who is our associate editor in chief at the JBBA, his paper on e voting for block, uh, on the blockchain. This is another important research uh, implementing the evidence based blockchains PCIO framework, problem comparison, intervention, and outcome framework for agri farming industry. Uh, this study was uh, received uh, a lot of national and international coverage. It was featured in the BBC, um, and um, it is uh, one of the world's first research applying the principles of evidence-based blockchain in the agriculture and farming industry. Again, this is an open access research conducted by researchers from Scotland. Paper was published in the JBB. The third step is once you have got the evidence, you, you identified the barriers, then you look at how to devise the roadmap, how to actually go about it. So you identify the key domains and the key areas of recommendation. So, you, so it's important to understand that you, you can either produce a very generic type of very visionary, esoteric kind of document with no specific goals or no specific timelines, or you could produce a very concrete set of recommendations or it can be a mixture of both. Uh, but you have to come up with certain set of recommendations for stakeholders to work on. Um, and, and, and it has to be uh, some smart objectives, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound, smart objectives. And you have to think and act globally. As we heard from various speakers, very important to focus on what is happening globally. Uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, workforce planning, workforce is becoming is global, people are working from home. So if you are thinking of uh, talent acquisition and retention, I think it was very, very important that you are now, you can tap into a global pool of talent. So if you are in, in, in France, for example, or in Germany, you have to look at how I can attract the best talent uh, from globally not just from your own country, because people are working from home and blockchain developers can work from anywhere in the world. So the next step is how do you measure the impact? So uh, there, are, there are some impact studies, uh, not a lot, but there are some impact studies on how blockchain is actually making a real world impact. And these could make some a part of your recommendations. And what data and evidence framework do you use to put forward the roadmap? So this is one framework that you could use uh, uh, called evidence-based blockchains PCIO framework, problem comparison, intervention, and outcome. What is the problem? What are the existing solutions, which is your comparison? How is your idea or project better than anybody else's? 
and and what is the evidence for that and then how do you measure the outcomes and you look at the quality of evidence uh, not all evidence is equal there is some good quality evidence and there is some bad quality evidence so you have to make sure that you start from the top of the uh, the hierarchy which is your filtered evidence peer reviewed research evidence synthesis national guidelines and and then if you don't have any of this data then you could look at non peer reviewed studies case studies uh, expert opinions reports etc this is uh, uh, another important case study looking at blockchain skills in demand I don't think it's um it's scrolling on on my screen. Is it scrolling now? No. What do you see, Brian? I see the UK blockchain roadmap. Just the the first the first slide. Oh 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 oh! Yeah, okay. Didn't realize it was you were going through. Hmm. Now. No. Hmm. What do you see now, Brian? Yes. Okay. Is it moving now? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so I was here. <clears throat> so, devising the roadmap, key domains, key recommendations, um, think and act globally, and how do you measure the impact? So, so this is a framework. Uh, again, it is open access. You may have seen this slide many times before. How policymakers, uh, regulators, and public services make decisions. on what blockchain case studies uh, are evidence based which uh, of the interventions work uh, and and what is the evidence for that talent important uh, as some of the other speakers have pointed out this morning uh, talent acquisition uh, is uh, there there is there is significant shortage of highly skilled uh, and quality blockchain uh, developers workforce and not just developers but but in all all, all other uh, domains uh, blockchain uh, was one of the uh, top most top top skill uh, according to to linkedin according to this research which was published in the jbba and and quite well paid as well so so what is your country's plan for for jobs making making sure that you you rec recruit and retain the best uh, talent so that is important so <clears throat> so the next step is ongoing strategy so who are the active stakeholders are they on board and how are you going to deliver the road map this is this is important so we are very lucky to have this uh, center for evidence based blockchain in the uk which is essentially a quadruple uh, helix uh, collaboration think tank uh, as of today we have 14 universities over 300 blockchain experts as well as uh, more than 300 editors and reviewers uh, globally from universities around the globe so academic expertise professional expertise was always a phone call away when we were uh, writing and drafting this roadmap and and it was of great help in producing the document and this is something that you can duplicate and replicate in your own region as well um, and for the first time in blockchain we uh, we produced um, uh, levels of evidence and grades of recommendation um, and this is something which is quite well established in other scientific disciplines but uh, not in the blockchain so um, very very important that we we uh, we look at uh, good quality evidence when we are making uh, policies next step is the execution so we proposed formation of sub specialty groups we are working towards that um, and further research what are the key deliverables and further stakeholders meeting and also what funding is available from from government so these are the sub specialty groups we proposed uh, eight citizens and public services crypto assets uh, academia social good governance allied disciplines and emerging tech uh, which includes daos nfts defi lightning network etc this is an example of a sub specialty group uh, so of those eight groups this is an example of how one group would look like so for crypto asset sub specialty group um, uh, it should have a representation from treasury bank of england financial conduct authority chain analysis providers academics uh, and obviously merchants and exchanges it's very important to have a multi uh 
uh, stakeholder input in in these spe sub specialty groups this is a research uh, that was uh, presented uh, last year at ic2021 looking at uh, the various funding that has been uh, made available to blockchain companies and organizations in the uk from innovate uk and as we can see that uh, there is a steady uh, increment in how many projects were awarded uh, how many uh, were successful in their grant application so i think this is another important uh, point to keep in mind that it's not just all about private funding and raising money uh, investors and vcs there is uh, uh, there are pools of uh, funds that may be available to you from government and public services very important to utilize them and then the last step is follow up and review um important to audit the societal impact um of blockchain applications uh, which is going to help you help you uh, help you make a strong case uh, for uh, to the policy makers because if you go and say here are the interventions that are based on blockchain and they have made a positive contribution they have helped us save cost they have streamlined our services they uh, uh, people like it and users like it it is effective uh, and then you have a much much better case of making it um, uh, and implementing it in, for public services in private sector if you can demonstrate that the interventions are making a positive impact so societal impact is an essential um, uh, part of uh, of this and then you make sure that whatever your domain is uh, you are helping overall this ecosystem with with successful use cases uh, and and further engagement and participation with stakeholders so impact uh, i have a separate talk on impact obviously there is no time uh, today to talk about that but this is an important slide so when we talk about impact as an academic uh, we just uh, some people think that is just acad academia citations references but the impact actually is eight things uh, and academia is just one of them so you have you have government and political impact impact on society and culture health and quality of life a international impact environment very important philip sandner was talking about bitcoin mining proof of work green energy so whatever your interventions are important that they are um they are uh, green and and environmental friendly as much as possible then uh, enterprise and industry and also uh, public uh, policy so the implications for any roadmap Uh, including uk's own blockchain roadmap is opportunities for growth uh future strategies and benchmarks consensus with stakeholders you take ownership if you participate in a committee if you participate in a in a sub specialty group you as an individual and a, and your association will take ownership so i think it's very important that communities take ownership of where this is uh, uh this is going as john glenn mentioned that it's a collaborative um teamwork we cannot just rely on government or our regulator to do everything right for us uh, everybody has to 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 chip in uh, research and development workforce planning uh, international relevance and partnerships as dr hossein mentioned earlier we have blockchain associations forum more than 50 countries are now part of it and blockchain associations working together on joint challenges most of the challenges that blockchain and crypto face these days are international so global context is extremely important and evidence based standards and frameworks so um i would like to con conclude my talk here um uh, by saying that these these are the sub specialty groups that we are working on so if you are an organization association company enterprise uh want to um be a part of uh, a future of uk's blockchain then we are very 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 happy to have you on board and and have a chat with you on how you can contribute to um Uh, the blockchain roadmap and help us implement its various recommendations so thank you very much thank you very much um an excellent excellent uh, disposition of the the uh uk roadmap um i did have one question that i wanted to ask you uh, that maybe you didn't touch on a little bit um you know you mentioned that you know people are free to um free to sort of uh, to, to to look at it's open source use 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 our roadmap um for their own national um organizations um 
and actually uh, given we had a little technical glitch there um, i do urge people to go to the um to the british blockchain association.org website uh, where you'll find um you'll find all the material on the roadmap there um so you can have a look properly but but the, my question to you would be um what was the biggest challenge um in putting it together what you know if if um if other organizations are thinking of using it as a, as a, as a template or even just thinking of creating their own, what, what, for you, what's been the, busy, the biggest challenge um, making it happen? I think the, the, there were two biggest, two big challenges for us. One challenge was to get all the information together because there is a lot of uh, um, various kind of uh, reports, case studies here and there. So, Getting all the information together was a big challenge, and that's why it took us almost a year to get uh, to get all the information, case reports, uh, analysis, evidence synthesis, um, and the other one was uh, to then work with the various stakeholders. So uh, working with uh, with members of parliament, blockchain all party parliamentary group, enterprises, academia. Um, so uh, I think the initial bit was uh, uh, quite challenging and time consuming. But uh, once you start the process and when, once you put pen on paper, then it gets easier. Um, but it's very important, as I said, you have to first of all identify what are the key challenges because every country is different. You cannot compare Germany with Sri Lanka, for example. Germany may have their own priorities in terms of how they see blockchain going in, in, in the next 10 years compared to Sri Lanka or or, or Nigeria or Argentina. So um, there is no one formula for all. And this is why I always say, if you are uh, planning to put together a roadmap, you have to be very meticulous and identify what are the key challenges in your own region uh, and then work towards them. Gather all the evidence uh, before you propose a solution. You have to ask questions first. What are the main problems that are faced currently? how blockchain can solve them and then uh, gather the evidence and then work towards it. I think if I could add to uh, Dr. Nakhvi's, uh, number one challenge was gathering the information and number two, if you remember, the quality of evidence. Uh, that was a difficult task as well because we were devising the national uh, roadmap. We couldn't devise a national roadmap on the basis of uh, weak evidence. Yes, we, that's right. Yeah, we had to dig into the quality of evidence we gathered. That so that's right. So, so this is this is the world's only roadmap, as far as I know, which has uh, uh, included all the peer-reviewed, high-quality research papers as references in the making of this roadmap. Yes, this is the only roadmap, only blockchain uh, national-level roadmap in the world, which has included peer-reviewed case studies uh, as references. And. All, and all other reports have, um, if you look at other reports, sometimes they include news articles, blog posts, opinion pieces. They are not high quality evidence. Opinion mm -hmm. pieces and blog posts are not good quality evidence. So this is the this is the only roadmap, as far as I know, which which includes um, scientific research and evidence. So so when when people from other organisations get a chance to, to look at it, are, are those elements included in the in, in the documentation we have on the website? Yeah, absolutely. All the references are there in the in the document itself. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Okay, thank you both very much. Thank you. So I think we, we conclude this session and uh, we go backstage for the next uh, research abstract presentations, yeah? Great, yes, so uh, oh. see you at uh, two o'clock. Okay, see you, thank you. I'll close the session now. Yeah.